In an egg lock, the first Pokemon I find in an area has to be swapped for an egg sent in from you guys, my handsome subscribers. And if a Pokemon faints, it's boxed forever. And so began my adventure through Unova by asking you guys to send me eggs, figuring I'll probably get enough eggs in a couple of days, and you guys proceeded to send me 2,400 eggs in the first two days. That's over twice as many eggs as you can actually fit in the game. So I swapped my starter Bacon for a randomly selected egg hatching into a Magikarp. Great. As if that wasn't useless enough, though, it's got slow start. Thanks, Enzo Dimitri. What a start. Luckily, Bianca's here to teach us how to catch Pokemon right away, and I can pick up a Purloin to swap for our next egg, which hatches into a Spiritomb, an incredibly powerful Pokemon, but don't celebrate just yet. Maximus Scott made sure to give this thing Truant, so this underachieving bundle of 108 souls doesn't make me half as excited as it should. My luck finally turns on Route 20, where we can pick up yet another encounter and hatch a third egg from Monkey Ninja Dude, who finally gives me a great ability and huge power, but it's on a pansage. Crap. At least it makes defeating Hughes Oshawott easy. <laughs> Before we challenge Charon, I can pick up another encounter at Flotchessy Ranch, but in this challenge, I only get to bring the same amount of Pokemon as the gym leader has into battle. And on top of that, I only get to hatch a new egg if I lose a Pokemon, so for now, I'm stuck with these guys to take on the first gym fight versus Charon. Now, Charon isn't known to be the most difficult gym leader, even on challenge mode. However, in this case, we don't have the strongest batch of Pokemon, and if we lose Panseer, it's pretty much completely lost. So instead, I lead with Spiritomb, as the Patrat uses the first turn to set up a workup, allowing me to get in with a faint attack to take it into the red. Not a huge problem for Charon, since he can just go for a potion to heal up the turn I'm loafing around. I then find out that we're speed tied, which is perfect since we don't have to take any damage from Patrat, taking it out with the next faint attack. Second out is Lillipup, and because we're forced to loaf around, it gets a free workup to boost its attack. And because Spiritomb is such a bulky boy, Charon goes for another workup to boost its attack to plus two. I then use Feint Attack, which is a two-hit KO, however, not after activating Lillipup's Ornberry. At this point, Charon's just getting greedy, but he boosts himself to plus three, and there's nothing I can do about it because of Truant. At this point, Charon's taunting me, setting up to plus four with another workup because he knows that another Feint Attack won't be enough. And during my Truant turn, Bite does over half to Spiritomb, activating my own Ornberry. That means a Feint Attack will take out Lillipup after this bite, but it ends up flinching me, meaning that Spiritomb died the way it lived, loafing around. And to be honest, I'm not sure if Pansage can take one hit from a plus four Lillipop. But Charon makes sure we never get to know the answer to that question by going for a fifth workup, just allowing us to take his Lillipop out. Not exactly setting a great example for the challenge mode AI, but he does still have Pidove, which for some reason goes for a quick attack instead of Gust, allowing me to go for a Fury Swipes hitting two times. And if I were a luckier man, the next Fury Swipes would be a KO. I guess you could say the real luck is that Pidove keeps spamming quick attack instead of a Gust, which would have just taken us out by now. Losing a Pokemon is bad, having lost it to Charon is pretty embarrassing, but I'll take my first gym badge. Having lost a Pokemon, at least we get to swap out that Riolu we caught at Flotchessy Ranch for a new egg, because Roxy's poison types are all super effective against Pansage, and Magikarp is... Magikarp. So there's a lot riding on this egg from Celestial Dragon Slayer being good. And though it's not effective against poison, I'll certainly take a Piplup. And one with Lightning Rod at that, meaning if we can keep this thing alive for when we face Elisa, this thing could put in some work. But for now, Primplup's just gonna be our best bet versus Roxy since Pansage is weak to poison, and Magikarp, despite having learned the mighty tackle at this point, is unfortunately one level away from evolving into Gyarados. Now I know I said Primplup's gonna have to carry this gym, but Primplup can't beat all three of Roxy's Pokemon alone. So he's gonna need some help from so he's gonna need some help from Pansage. A huge power bite does massive damage to coughing and even manages to get a flinch, and I probably should have just gone for bite again since this thing has an Orenberry. Instead, I try my non-existent Fury Swipes luck, which of course only gets two hits, but coughing just goes for assurance. I then go for another Fury Swipes, which of course just barely falls short of the KO, and a Venishock takes Pansage down to one HP. I gain an insignificant amount of health back with my Orenberry as Roxy then goes for a super potion allowing me a free bite before I get another flinch with the next bite, meaning a third is enough to take out Coughing, sending in her second Pokemon, Grimer. My best bet is once again bite, and after a first flinch, I hit it down into the red and miss out on the flinch, this time going down to a Venishock. Pansage at least did her duty, almost taking out two of Roxy's Pokemon, and I go for a Metal Claw to take Grimer out just in case I get that attack boost. I do not, going into the final showdown versus Whirlipede, boostless. Venishock, however, is only doing about 20% to Rom 
Romulus, whereas Bubble Beam is doing like 40% to Whirlipede. It does, however, have a Citrus Berry, meaning that what would otherwise be a three-hit KO now turns into a four-hit KO. However, because it looks like it's gonna take five turns for Whirlipede to take us out, and it doesn't get any critical hits, we end up once again just barely scraping by, this time on four HP and collecting our second gym badge. Having lost a Pokemon, we actually get to hatch two eggs since Berg has four Pokemon in challenge mode. So after enduring discount John Travolta flush his acting career down the toilet, we hatch another egg into Kangaskhan. Viewer Lolly even gave it Technician, which I imagine is gonna be incredibly powerful. With a quick boat ride, we head for Castalia City, where I immediately go to the sewers to pick up a wild Pokemon that we can swap for our next egg. This one from Curbs hatching into a simple Larvesta, an incredibly powerful combination if we can keep it alive until it evolves. At this stage, Magikarp has also evolved into Gyarados, and even though it has slow start, it's actually a pretty good Pokemon. The biggest reason being that before we take on Berg, it learns Dragon Rage. So even though our Gyarados is slow as dirt and hits about as hard as a wet paper towel, it can always hit for 40 damage with Dragon Rage, and because it has amazing defense and Razor Leaf only does neutral damage from Levani, it only takes a few Dragon Rages to waste Berg's Hyper Potion and eventually take out the Levani. And because his other Pokemon are not worthy of challenge mode, I can very quickly slap them out of existence with Technician Kangaskhan, meaning I'm stuck with this team for taking on a Lisa, and having Lightning Rod Primplup may be a little overconfident. You see, this fight is not as straightforward as I thought it would be with a Pokemon immune to Electric. First of all, her team has four Pokemon, so the collective chip damage from non-Electric type moves against Primplup would be enough to do me in. My overconfident behind didn't really think about that going into the fight, so I just lead with Gyarados to bait the Volt Switch and get a Lightning Rod boost for Romulus. Romulus then takes about a quarter from Aerial Ace and can fight back with a Bubble Beam, doing over half to Amalga, activating its Citrus Berry. It then for some reason goes for Pursuit, doing very little damage and allowing me to take it down into the red with another Bubble Beam. Elisa then heals up to full with a Hyper Potion, but another Bubble Beam is enough to take Amolga below half. An Aerial Ace then takes Romulus down to just 29 HP, and a final Bubble Beam takes out the Amolga. Second out is Joltik, and I don't think I can one-hit KO this thing with a Bubble Beam, so I have to swap out, especially since it has Energy Ball. Joltik's special attack isn't crazy though, so Kangaskhan can easily tank it and then get over half damage with Technician Fake Out. From there, Kanga's fast and can finish off the Joltik with a bite. Third out is Flaffy, but I want to deal as much damage as I can to Zabstrika with Kangaskhan, so I decide to go for Circle Throw with negative priority, meaning that I do get paralyzed in the process by a Thunder Wave. This lets Zabstrika start paraflinching me with Stomp, but luckily Kangaskhan is incredibly bulky, not even taking that much damage. Even so, after a few unlucky consecutive turns of paralysis, Kangaskhan is taken dangerously low. I have to switch out, and unfortunately Zabstrika reads my switch, going for Pursuit, almost taking Kangaskhan out. I send in Gyarados, which I only do to bait the Electric-type move to swap in Romulus and get that boost. I immediately, however, realize that this is a terrible plan and swap out into Kirby, who of course gets stepped on on the switch. Zebstrika then goes for Pursuit, I suppose expecting me to swap out once again, but it doesn't deal that much damage and I can hit back with a Flame Charge, getting me plus two speed because of Simple and activating Zebstrika's Citrus Berry. I'm still not faster, however, getting hit by another Pursuit, as I go for String Shot to lower Zabstrika's speed. I then go for another String Shot to try and make sure I can outspeed with Romulus, which is when Zabstrika starts Flame Charging to try and boost its speed back up. I really can't allow this if I want to get through this fight alive, so I go for another String Shot to further lower Zabstrika's speed as it takes out Kirby with a Flame Charge. Now the real question is, is Gyarados going to be able to outspeed Zabstrika at plus four with Slow Start? Of course the answer is no, but Zabstrika luckily goes for Pursuit, allowing me to go for Dragon Rage, which which isn't quite enough to take Substrika out. She then goes for Volt Switch, which doesn't just take out Gyarados, it also switches Substrika out since she has Flappy in the back, removing all of those speed drops. I send in Romulus, hoping to take out Flappy with a Bubble Beam, but I just barely fall short. She seems to have forgotten about Lightning Rod, however, giving me a boost and also just allowing me to take Flappy out with another Bubble Beam. I'm then fairly certain I'll just fall to Stomp, but Substrika goes for Pursuit again, throwing the game and allowing me to take it out with a bubble beam. That's right, Elisa, you may have taken half of my team, but you still have to face the facts that I remain Unova's top model. And with two Pokemon lost, our journey continues by hatching another two eggs. The first being a Chatot from the Multiverse Champion, actually one of my favorite Pokemon. Doesn't hurt that it also has Technician, since its signature move Chatter is exactly 60 base power. Our next egg from Red Toku hatches into a Caterpie with bad dreams. The sad irony for Butterfree being 
that its life would be the only nightmare. As it bravely gets crushed behind a rock avalanche in a noble sacrifice to allow Romulus to come in and finish off the fight with an aqua jet. It was the safest way to get the fifth badge, but something I'll have to live with for the rest of my life. With five badges collected, we're still only allowed to have four Pokemon, so I hatch my next egg from Shadow King 3603 into an Arcan, and I didn't realize how many people actually sent me Pokemon with Technician, but in this case, it's incredibly good since Archeops is a very strong Pokemon that normally just has the drawback of its moves becoming super weak after it's taken down below half health. As I progress towards Miss Stralton City, I make sure to pick up encounters on the way to have Pokemon to swap for eggs if I need them later. I then have to win the Pokemon World Tournament, which admittedly is pretty easy since on challenge mode, they're still at level 25. So we pick up the W without breaking a sweat. We can also pick up a whole bunch of cool items that we get access to, albeit we need to do a lot of grinding. Then once I make my way through Miss Stralton Cave, I run into Juniper who gives me a Master Ball. I shall use it responsibly. Ooh, a Fungus. Scala's team is generally one of the easiest gyms in the entire franchise, except in challenge mode, her team is pretty beefed up. Swoobat, however, is still as underwhelming as ever and just gets one shot by a technician boosted stab smackdown. Swana, on the other hand, is both faster than Archeops and can take it out in a single surf, so I'm forced to swap out into Romulus, who barely takes any damage from the resisted hit at all. The one issue with this strategy is that Empoleon doesn't really have any great moves to go for itself against Swana, so I just have to fire back with surfs, which is actually doing a decent amount of damage. And while the process takes me down into the red, I can eventually take Swana out with enough surfing. Even though we can resist a psychic from Sigilyph, being at such low health, there is no chance we're surviving, so I'm forced to swap back in Archeops, who because of having Technician isn't put in Defeat Estranged from Psychic and can take out Sigilyph with a single smackdown. Finally, we're left with the most problematic Pokemon on Skyla's team, Skarmory, which would have been way easier to deal with if Empoleon were at full health. Unfortunately, we're instead going to have to improvise and I U-turn out into Kangaskhan, who can tank a Steel Wing quite well. I then go for the free chip damage with Fake Out, which barely does anything, and neither does Bite, as Skarmory sets up its speed with agility. I'm then hit by another soft Steel Wing, the real problem being that I can't deal too much damage with these resisted Bites. And after Skarmory gets 25% of its health back from its Citrus Berry, I'm really feeling the uphill nature of this battle. With Kangaskhan now in the red as well, I've only gotten Skarmory just below half health, and I'm now forced to swap into my only Pokemon left with full HP, which gets nailed by an Aerial Ace on the Switch. I'm then hit by another Steel Wing that just misses the KO, but it raises Skarmory's defense. I do manage to get Skarmory to the red with Chatter, but Skyla still has her Hyper Potion, and knowing that she'll probably use it, I go for another Chatter to get a bit of damage. But because I was unable to land a Confusion, that's sadly the last note that Chatot sings. I swap back to Kangaskhan to get a bit of damage with Fake Out, but it's all I get to do before an Aerial Ace takes out Kangaskhan too. So sadly, with Empoleon one hit away from being taken out and our Archeops not being able to outspeed Skarmory because of agility, it's a wipe. The entire Technician squad has been taken out and Romulus will be soon to follow. And so with a final Aerial Ace, Skarmory gets the victory. The resisted hit isn't enough to take Romulus out, so with a final serve, we can claim the sixth Oh, that's how it's gonna be, huh? Stumbling an inch away from victory. Wait a minute, I've got Aqua Jet. Never mind. You thought you'd won, Skyla? Get fu Admittedly, our team is not looking too hot right now, but as long as we've got one Pokemon left, we can still hatch some eggs. We still only get to have four Pokemon on our team, so hatching three eggs, the first one from Flygon HG is a Sap Sipper Giraffe Egg. Not a lot of grass types coming up, but I'm hoping we can put Beep Beep to good use. My next egg from HEOSDE ends up being an Axew. And honestly, having weak armor on this thing seems like it would be way more beneficial than detrimental. Finally, the third egg from Starblazer43 hatches into a Zorua. And Moody also seems like an ability that skews towards useful, but could definitely screw me over. Because of the level cap being at 52, I can get two of the most iconic Pokemon in Unova to evolve into Zoroark, and one of the possibly best shinies of all time, Haxorus, who's going to be incredibly useful going into the seventh gym fight versus the dragon type gym leader, Drayden. Normally, an incredibly threatening gym full of dragon types, but because we have weak 
Armor Haxorus, I can just slap a Focus Sash on this thing, and because we're surviving any move that Drudagon goes for no matter what, I can set up to plus two with a Swords Dance. Then when he hits me with a move that can't ever knock me out, I get my weak armor speed boost, getting me up to plus two speed, allowing me to outspeed his entire team. From there, I just unleash a flurry of plus two Dragon Claws, which is enough to take out all four of Drayden's Pokemon. Meaning our team doesn't actually change between Gym 7 and 8. Before I can head to Humalout to take on Marlin, however, Team Plasma decides to invoke the second Ice Age, which, you know, is pretty inconvenient to me since I'm trying to become a Pokemon Master. But then again, I'm one of the lucky ones who didn't get hit by the Frost. Unlike the thousands who lost either their lives or loved ones, I owe it to them to rid this town of these cold-hearted Sky Pirates, humiliating their leader by crushing his ice types with my dragon. And after all that, the city's still a frozen scar on the land. But look on the bright side, the vending machine still works somehow. Look at these disgusting rich people in Humalau just frolicking about when they know that thousands just lost their lives. One of those disgusting people, incidentally, happens to be Leader Marlin. The man is a team full of water types, and if we manage to defeat him, we can fill up our team all the way to six. So I lead with Zoroark, holding an Absorb Bulb in case we get hit by a water move, which seems likely, and do over half to the Waylord with a Dark Pulse as it just sets up the rain with Rain Dance. Moody then boosts my attack and lowers my accuracy, which isn't awesome, so I decide to swap out to not risk missing. So I swap into Empoleon, getting hit by Scald, at least not getting burned. I then go for Brine, which because of its special effect and the rain is enough to take out the Waylord. Second out is Jellicent, and I don't figure it can do too much damage to me, so I stay in and take a Scald, which also doesn't end up getting a burn, leaving me at 69 HP, and allows me to lower Jellicent's speed with Bulldoze. After Cursed Body disables it, though, I only have water moves to hit this thing with, and because it's so specially bulky, I decide to swap into Zoroark, who takes a Scald. Now, I did this completely forgetting about the rain, so I'm very lucky that Zoroark actually survived, and I get my special attack boost from Absorb Bulb. Moody then gives me plus two speed and minus one attack, after which I can outspeed with the Dark Pulse and take out the Jellicent in one hit. Third out is Mantine, which has massive special defense, so even with plus one, I am not one-shotting this thing, so I swap out with U-Turn instead, and because Empoleon is so low on health, I swap in Beep Beep. On top of that, Beep Beep just has way more potential to do damage to this Mantine with the physical Zen Headbutt, taking it down into the red. Mantine then hits a Scald, which now of all times gets a burn against my physical attacker. Because burn would knock Beep Beep out, I'm forced to swap out into my only Pokemon that's still at full health, Rex. But this just ends up being a free switch since Marlin decides to heal up to full with a Hyper Potion. I then hit him with a Dragon Claw, taking Mantine back into the red, and since I still have that Focus Sash, there's no way that Ice Beam could ever take me out, and another Dragon Claw takes out the Mantine. This just leaves Marlin with Caracosta, which honestly is a bit of a threat, which means I'm forced to do something I'm not too happy about, sending in Romulus, who can at least tank the Rock Slide and fire back with a Surf. With Life Orb, it deals a lot of damage, and after Citrus Berry, it only gets back to about half health, after which, sadly, Romulus goes down to a rock slide. He's saved the run multiple times and been the most useful team member consistently throughout the entire run. And one final time, through his noble sacrifice, he enables the victory for Zoroark, granting us our final gym badge. Walk the plank, you degenerate. Having all eight badges means that we now get to have a full team, and because we lost a Pokemon, we've got to hatch three eggs. And from the first Tyrantrum, I receive an Auron. The second one from Dystrophy hatches into a Lapras. And the third from the Purple Penguin, it's a Delibird. I mean, it's a Delibird with Intimidate, so it's only almost worthless. Lapras has Pickpocket, and because Challenge Mode enemies actually have a fair few items, it might come in handy. And Auron comes with Levitate, which is just insane on an Aggron. I guess Marlin took that Plank stuff pretty literally, since he he brings us the pirates, and we still need to get revenge for what these guys did to Opelucid City. That said, Colrus is an incredibly dangerous foe on challenge mode, especially with a team like mine that doesn't have any super effective stab moves against Steel. Colrus begins with Magneton, and I figure I can get it with a quad effective Bulldoze, but he manages to Volt Switch out before I get to do it, sending in his Matang, which does take over half from a Bulldoze, but Clear Body prevents us from lowering its speed. However, Agron is somehow just faster 
blaster and takes it out with another bulldoze, sending in Kling Clang. The worst thing Kling Clang can do to us is a thunderbolt, which does take us dangerously low, but we can fire back with a brick break to both break the balloon and take Kling Clang to about 40%. We're then extremely dead to another thunderbolt, so I swap out into Rex, who can resist it. However, I end up getting paralyzed. This unfortunately allows Kling Clang to set up its speed and attack with shift gear, so if we don't break through paralysis, which we do, we would have been in a lot of trouble. And honestly, that paralysis could still cause a bunch of trouble. Next is Magnazone, for some reason hitting us with a resisted discharge instead of flash cannon, allowing us to fire off a quad effective bulldoze, taking it down to its sturdy. Chorus then just full restores as I get paralyzed, completely negating my entire bulldoze. A flash cannon then takes me dangerously low, and I get fully paralyzed, unfortunately taking Rex completely out of the game. So to get a safe switch, I swap in Delibird, who gets off a completely useless intimidate against this special attacker, and then falls to one single flash cannon. Great job, Delibird. I think you did about as good as everybody expected, so I send in Beep Beep instead to hope to do some damage. But unfortunately at this point, I'm down to Pokemon that only have resisted moves. So while Beep Beep does manage to get Magnazone below half health, another discharge takes it out. It's a sad day for giraffe kind everywhere, but that damage that Beep Beep managed to do means that Lapras can come in, outspeed, and take out Magnazone's remaining health. This leaves Colrus with two Pokemon, the first of which being Behem, which Colrus eventually swaps out. Kind of annoying since Zoroark can't touch Magnazone, so I'm forced to U-turn out back into Lapras, which certainly isn't ideal since Lapras is weak to electric and after getting Thunderwaved, slower than Magneton. For some reason, however, Magneton decides to go for Tri-Attack instead of Volt Switch, which probably would have just taken out Lapras. So after counting my blessings and wanting to preserve Lapras, I swap back out into Zoroark. The Magneton then hits me with another Tri-Attack on the Switch, which very fortunately doesn't land a status condition, and Moody even lowers our speed. However, even at minus one speed, Zoroark is still fast enough to outspeed both Magneton and Behem, granting us the victory with only two losses. And unfortunately, Colrus isn't even the big bad of Team Plasma. So I head back to the Pokemon Center to hatch a couple more eggs, the first of which being a Bidoof from Daxter. Thanks, Daxter. Now, oh, great, it won't ever hit a move ever because of Hustle. Really appreciate it, Daxter. The second egg from Major Laser Blazer hatches into a Voltorb. A Voltorb with stall. So just in case you didn't know, let me tell you everything about Voltorb. Number one, it's fast. Number two, nothing else. So as you understand, this electrode has a lot going for it. Before we take on Getsis, we have to take on White Curum, and we don't actually get a break in between the two fights. Luckily, I found a way to defeat Curum White instantaneously. This way, we won't have any damaged Pokemon versus Getsis, and it just involves slapping a Choice Band on Haxorus and taking it out with a Dragon Claw. Getting the Choice items from the Pokemon World Tournament is generally a really good idea and can let you pull off things like this, defeating the game's boss in mere seconds. We do still have to take on Getsis, however, with a full team of six, and of course, we start with Haxorus since we don't get to change up our team whatsoever. I'm expecting Kafagrigus to poison me here, so I swap out into Zoroark, but even better, it just goes for protection Protect, wasting the turn, and giving me a special defense boost from Moody and lowering my speed. Zoroark is still faster, and with a stab Dark Pulse, we take out the Kafagrigus in one hit. Moody then triggers at the end of the turn again, this time sharply boosting our special attack and lowering evasiveness, which doesn't actually matter that much. Drapion comes in, and of course I forget I'm at minus one speed, taking a ton of damage from x -Scissor before I U-turn out since I don't have any great moves versus it. I then send in Agron, and the moment I click a move, I realize this Drapion has Earthquake, but it doesn't end up going for it, instead opting for barely any damage at all with a Night Slash, letting me take it down into the red with a Bulldoze. A full restore gets it back up to full health, but allowing me to get off a free Bulldoze, not just getting it below half, but also lowering its speed enough that I can outspeed the next turn, taking it out with another Bulldoze. I unfortunately don't have any great moves versus Seismitoad, so I'm forced to swap out, this time sending in Bee Barrel, who does get hit by a Muddy Water, and as luck has it, gets an accuracy drop. 
I then have no explanation for how the 90% accurate Hyperfang hits through an accuracy drop and hustle. Regardless, it just barely misses out on the KO against Seismitoad, and after getting hit by Drain Punch, I am forced to swap out, sending back in Haxorus. I'm hit by a Drain Punch on the Switch, which is really more of a good thing since it barely does any damage and doubles my speed because of weak armor. And with my Choice Band already boosting my attack, there's no question that I take out the Seismitoad. Next is Hydreigon, which Haxorus is normally just a touch too slow to handle, but with weak armor, we can easily outspeed, and a banded Dragon Claw is definitely enough to take it out. Getsus then only has two more Pokemon, which aren't a problem at all for Rex to deal with with its massive stats. And thus, having beaten all of Team Plasma, it's time to head for Victory Road, which never actually ended up taking any Pokemon from the team, meaning my final team is forced upon me, since I'm not allowed to hatch any eggs unless I lose a Pokemon. So I've got Moody Zoroark with Dark Pulse Nest plot flamethrower and u-turn the hovering agron with iron head heavy slam brick break and bulldoze weak armor haxorus with dragon claw bulldoze brick break and swords dance pickpocket lapras with surf ice beam psychic and perish song stall electrode with thunderbolt volt switch charge beam and explosion and hustle bee barrel with strength waterfall superpower and curse and so with my final preparations made it was time to take on the elite four and one of the elite four members in particular has a really strong matchup versus our Pokemon, but I'm gonna tell you right now, that's not Chantal. My plan was simply elementary, set up to plus two with a nasty plant as the Confagrigus goes for a burn with Will-O-Wisp, which I can then heal off with a Rostberry. From there, Moody boosts my accuracy by plus two, but then lowers my special attack back to just plus one. Fortunately, this is more than enough to take out the Confagrigus, basically just getting us that plus one special attack for free. Moody once again increases our accuracy, but lowers our speed. Initially, this isn't a problem at all, since Chantal sends in Gullurk, which is slower than a box of rocks, so we outspeed anyway and take it out with a Dark Pulse. Then to add insult to injury, Moody boosts our defense and further lowers our speed, and if that would have been special defense, I may have contemplated staying in here versus Chandelure. However, this thing is choice scarfed, and it also just naturally hits like a truck, taking Rex down below half. I was really hoping Haxorus could take a resisted hit better, leaving me with just the option of swapping out again, this time into Bee Barrel, who actually ends up tanking the Fire Blast slightly better than Haxorus, and the next turn, the Fire Blast even misses, and we somehow connect with a Waterfall for the KO. You know, I really have nothing bad to say about Hustle Bee Barrel at this point in time. It is kind of an issue that we got burned by Flame Body, so when Drift Blim comes in, I have to swap out back into Zoroark. I get nailed by a Thunderbolt on the Switch, but it doesn't even do half. Moody then triggers to boost my special defense, which is good, but lower my special attack, which is very bad. However, I don't even think Dark Pulse would have KO'd at neutral anyway, and we still get over half damage, and because of the special defense increase, we barely take anything from that Thunderbolt. Moody then immediately comes in clutch, boosting my special defense at two, putting me at plus one, and allowing me to take out the Drift Blim. Finally, she's got a Banette, but at plus one, it's an easy knockout, granting us victory versus the first Elite Four member. The second member I decide to challenge is Caitlyn, mostly because she's also weak to Dark, and we can employ a very similar strategy that we used against Chantal. Again, I start the fight by going for Nasty Plot to boost my special attack to plus two as the Musharna goes for Hypnosis. Once we heal off the Sleep of the Chestoberry, it's just a free Nasty Plot, and Moody boosts my special defense and unfortunately also lowers my special attack again. From there, however, she doesn't have a Pokemon with a Choice Scarf, so she's a lot less threatening than Chantal, allowing me to just take out the rest of her team with one single move each. The third member I decide to challenge is Grimsley, because a strategy popped up in my head immediately, and frankly, Marshall scares me. The most annoying Pokemon that Grimsley has is Liopard, since, for one, it's got the normal gem boosted Fake Out, which barely does anything since it's quad resisted by Tantrum, but it then goes for its most annoying move, Attract, immobilizing me by love, However, after just one Night Slash, which does get a crit but still barely does anything, I take out the Liopard with one single Heavy Slam. Taking care of Liopard serves a second purpose, since we can gobble up the Intimidate before we swap out into Rex. 
Much like Versus Get says, Rex is equipped with a choice band, meaning that after we get hit by this critical hit crunch, taking Rex extremely low and activating weak armor, which we don't necessarily actually need, we can start executing the main plan, which is just firing off choice band boosted brick breaks, which unfortunately is enough to just seize the victory. Why do I say unfortunately? Well, we now have to go up against Marshall with this team. Four Pokemon weak to fighting, and of the other two, one of them doesn't have a single super effective move against fighting, and it gets frailer the more it gets hit, and the other one's stall electrode. The safest way of going into this fight would probably be wearing an adult diaper, but since I don't have any, I'm going with the next best option, sending in Rex. I fire off a Dragon Claw, which actually ends up doing substantial damage to throw, taking it way below half as it then hits me with a bulldoze, lowering my speed. The speed drop here isn't really an issue, though, since it's immediately fixed by weak armor. Not that throw would be outspeeding minus one hacks for us anyway, so it just goes down to another Dragon Claw. Claw. Marshall then sends in Mian Chao, but because we're at plus one speed and holding a choice band, I feel very confident we could just one-shot it with a Dragon Claw. I don't have the same confidence at all facing Conkeldur, so I elect to swap out, sending in B-Barrel. This sacrificial play doesn't work out for me at all, since Marshall goes for bulk up, boosting its attack and speed, and then gets a burn, boosting its attack further with guts. I then fail to get a flinch with Waterfall, dooming B-Barrel to getting smushed by Hammer Arm, which at least lowers Conkeldur's speed. Because Conkeldur has boosted defense, I decide to not send in Haxorus, instead going for my special attacker Zoroark. I fire off a flamethrower, hoping it'll take it out, but it leaves Conkeldur in the yellow, and Zoroark also gets smushed by Hammer Arm. The worst part about this is Conkeldur isn't even taken out by Burn, it's just put into healing range. Now what I probably should have done here is sent in Haxorus and seen if two Dragon Claws would be enough to take it out. Instead, like an idiot, I send in Aggron first and at least get off a free Heavy Slam. My next mistake is going for Heavy Slam again, which probably does a bit more damage than Iron Head, but Iron Head would have at least had that chance to flinch. And so Agron becomes the third victim of Conkeldur's hammer arm. At this point, Haxorus can definitely finish off Conkeldur, but it's kind of too late since it's already taken out half of our team. At this point, we only have Haxorus, Lapras, and Stall Electrode left, and luckily, Haxorus gets a critical hit versus Lucario, which I think was necessary to get the one shot. This leaves only Sock, but because Weak Armor hasn't activated yet, we can get the KO in two Dragon Claws, granting us the victory, meaning with our three remaining Pokemon, Pokemon, we can take on Champion Alder. Ah! Right, the incident. Who's the champion again? With only three Pokemon left, we have no choice but to take on the champion. And Challenge Mode Iris is one of the toughest champions of all time, rivaling even Cynthia. Because she has a team full of dragons, it makes sense to lead with Rex, since I can immediately take out High Dragon with one Dragon Claw. The more Pokemon we can eliminate from Iris's team as soon as possible, the better. Speaking of which, Drudagon is a Pokemon we can get rid of as soon as it hits the battlefield with yet another super effective Dragon Claw. From here, it gets trickier, since we do have super super effective Brick Break versus Lapras, but there's no way it's ever gonna one-hit KO, so I send in my own Lapras to tank the Blizzard. And while we barely take any damage, the next turn it goes for Thunder, doing about 40%. But I have an electric secret weapon of my own, Specs Thunder, which does over 50% to the Lapras. A second Thunder does connect, taking our Lapras down to just 15 HP and getting Paralysis, but we manage to break through, taking out the Lapras with another Specs Thunderbolt. Iris then sends in Agron, and because we're paralyzed, we're not gonna outspeed, and a Rockhead Double Edge takes us out. With only two Pokemon left versus Iris's three, I send back in Rex and go for a quad effective Brick Break, and despite Agron not having Sturdy, it leaves it with just a smidge as it boosts its speed with a Totemize. Iris then predictably goes for a full restore, healing her Agron back up to full, allowing me to go for a Bulldoze to lower Agron's speed, which means that even after the Atotomize, we'll be able to outspeed the next turn and take it out with another Brick break. In comes Iris' own Haxorus, which can be super tough to deal with on challenge mode because of its Focus Sash Dragon Dance combo. So I immediately fire off a Dragon Claw to take Haxorus down to its Focus Sash as it hits me with an Outrage. It's more than certainly enough to take out Rex, however, I've got a Focus Sash of my own, leaving Rex at just 1 HP and activating Weak Armor. This way, after we take out the Haxorus the next turn with another Dragon Claw, we will be faster than Iris' final Pokemon, Archeops. And while I'm not expecting this final Dragon Claw to take Archeops out, it does put it in defeatist range. Because after Rex goes down, we only have one Pokemon left. 
it's Stall Electrode. And because of Defeatist, even if Archeops would have gotten a critical hit Stone Edge, we still would have survived, able to take it out with a Thunderbolt, meaning that with just one Pokemon left, I managed to beat a Pokemon White 2 Hardcore Egglock. You guys sent in some awesome Pokemon that I'm really glad I got to try out. And while it's unfortunate I couldn't showcase all the thousands of eggs you guys sent in, it's all the more reason to try and beat every generation as an Egglock to see if your egg gets to be in the video. So subscribe, let me know if you think that's a good idea, and until we see each other next time, have a good one.